Funtao would like to extend a warm welcome to our viewers and listeners. Please join us in following the domestic and international news on 24 Hours Channel. Right now, let's go through the main noteworthy contents that have been addressed in today's program. In 2002, Brenda Heist was 43 years old. She lived with her husband Lee and with two children in Lancaster County, southeastern Pennsylvania. An 8-year-old daughter named Morgan and a 12-year-old son named Lee Jr. During that time, she and her husband was getting a divorce. Brenda tried to get her own apartment but didn't qualify for government assistance. On February 8, Brenda took her two children to school. She was feeling depressed, overwhelmed and distraught. After she dropped him off at school, she drove to a nearby town. She walked to a park and sat on a bench and cried. Two strangers approached her and asked her if she was alright. That was the last known sighting of Brenda. Four days later, the police found her car near the bench where she sat in a bus station lot. The police felt that she was abducted or that her husband Lee had done something to her. They never even thought that she might have ran away. Since Lee was a suspect in the case, the community shunned him. Other parents didn't allow their kids to play with Lee's kids. He also lost his job and eventually also his house. Other than Lee, there were never really any other suspects. The case soon grew cold and would remain that way for the next 11 years. On April 26 of 2013, a 54-year-old woman, Kelsey Leanne Smith, surrendered herself to the Monroe County Sheriff's Office. She told the officers that she was tired of running away and that she was in fact Brenda Heist. While Lee and the two children were wondering what happened to Brenda, she was safe and sound in Florida. It turned out that while Brenda was sitting on a bench and crying, that a group of homeless people came across her and asked her if she would like to travel with them, to which she said yes. They went to Key Largo, where they lived under bridges and ate from garbage cans. After that, she moved in with a man into a trailer where they lived for the next seven years. When that didn't work out, she went back to living on the streets. In December 2012, she got a job as a live-in housekeeper in Tampa Bay. A few months later, Police pulled Brenda over for driving with an expired license plate and found drugs in her car. She served two months in jail. After she was released, she went back to jail for a few weeks on an identity theft charge. After that, she lived in a tent community run by a Florida social service agency. This all led to her finally telling the officers who she really was. Her two children were already in college when they found out and they want absolutely nothing to do with her. Morgan was quoted as saying, I hope to eventually forgive her one day for myself, not for her. John Darwin was born on August 14, 1915, England. On 22 December of 1973, he married Anne Stevenson. He worked as a teacher and later decided to become a prison officer. On the 21st of March 2002, John was seen paddling out to sea in his kayak. When he didn't show up for work, he was reported as missing. A massive search was launched immediately. The next day, a paddle was found that could have belonged to John. Later that day, the wreckage of the kayak was found. The rescuers were amazed by how John could have gotten into such big trouble when the conditions were so good. His death certificate was then issued, which allowed his wife to claim £25,000 of insurance. The mortgage of £130,000 was also paid off. On December 1st of 2007, John Darwin walked into the police station in London and claimed he had no memory of the last five years. The police did not believe him and did some investigating. This is what they found. The Darwins faked John's death. He went to live next door to their family home 
and moved back in with his wife in 2003. Also in 2003, one of her tenants actually saw John and asked him, aren't you supposed to be dead? But John convinced him to keep quiet. In 2006, the Darwins flew to Panama since they considered moving there permanently. Here is a photo of the two of them, took of an estate agent. They sold all of their properties in the UK and moved to Panama. Panama's laws changed however in 2007, which meant John needed UK police to verify who he was. He couldn't do this of course, since he was supposed to be dead. It was then that he decided to go back to the UK and pretend that he had amnesia for the last five years. The photo of the couple that was taken in 2006 was crucial evidence of their scam. The Darwin's children was at first elated to hear their father was alive, but when they heard what their parents did, they chose to no longer have contact with their parents. On July 23rd of 2008, John Darwin and Anne Darwin were both convicted of fraud. They had to sell all their properties to pay back the money. Charles Bothwell and Monique Dillard was a Detroit couple living with their son Charlie. Early 2014, the couple reported their son Charlie missing. Charles even went on live television and was interviewed by Nancy Grace. He would not believe what happened during this interview. Reports that your son has been found in your basement. Sir, Mr. Bothell, are you? Are what? You, yeah, we are getting reports that your son has been found alive in your basement. What? Yes, that's what. If, if you could hand me that wire very quickly. Yeah, we're getting that right now. From from yeah. How how could your son be alive in your basement? Uh, 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 oh, oh shit! Uh, I, I have n I have no idea. Uh, I, I, uh, now this is just a report that we are hearing out of Detroit that we're trying to confirm. Um, oh God, everybody please. in New York, please get on it. Uh, let me know when we get Charlie Langton from WWJ. We've been we've been on the lookout for him. We searched that entire house repeatedly. The FBI searched, the Detroit police searched. We've all searched. That is right. 11 days after Charlie went missing, he was found in a family's basement. Charlie claimed that his mother locked him in a basement and he was too afraid to come out. In April 2015, the couple were arrested and charged with torture and second-degree child abuse. Charles pleaded guilty. He also stated that he beat his son with a PVC pipe. He was sentenced to 18 months of probation and mandatory anger management classes. Monique accepted a plea deal, but the details were not made public. On April 26 of 1964, Dora Fronzak and her husband, Chester Fronzak, had their first child by the name of Paul. A woman, dressed up as a nurse, took their baby from the Chicago hospital. The woman was never seen again. Only the next day did the hospital inform Chester and Dora that their baby was missing and the police was called. The case got a lot of media attention and it led to a massive FBI investigation. Even though they searched for a year, they came up with nothing. Then, around 14 months after Paul disappeared, a baby was found in front of a department store in Newark, New Jersey. An FBI agent heard about this. There was no blood samples or fingerprints taken from Paul, so they had no idea whether this baby was him or not. There was however one photo of Paul. The FBI agent found that the ear of Paul and the ear of the baby that was found looked similar. 
and took the baby to Dora and Chester Franzak. Dora and Chester did not know if it was their baby or not, but there were so much media attention on them and they were scared that if they sent the baby back that it could have been Paul. So they raised the baby as Paul Franzak. When Paul was 10 years old, he found news articles about the time he was kidnapped. Ever since then, it was a nagging thought in the back of his head. He noticed that he looked different than his family members and had totally different interests. Eventually, when he became a father, he decided to act on suspicion and find out the truth. After sending in his DNA sample, he found out that there was no chance that he was actually Paul Franzak. He then had two questions. Who is he really? And where is the real Paul Franzak? He contacted genetic genealogist C.C. Moore to help him answer those questions. They learned that his real name was Jack Rosenthal. He also learned that he had a twin sister but also went missing by the name of Jill Rosenthal. Yes, they did name the twins Jack and Jill. That answered one question, but raised another. What happened to Jill? Paul's new family provided a few clues. His real parents abandoned Jack, and Jill disappeared some time later. His parents was going through a separation during that time, and both of them passed away in the 1990s due to cancer. In December of 2019, the real Paul Franzak was found. His children heard of the case and was sure that it was their dad, and it turned out it was. All we know is that he lives in Michigan with his family. He does not want to be known. Flora was born in 1939 in New York. After she finished school, she worked at a Concord for a few summers. The Concord was a resort with more than 1,200 rooms. She was one of hundreds of people that flocked to the area to work there over the summer. A man by the name of Robert Stevens also worked at a Concord. By 1975, they were married. On August 3rd of 1975, Robert took his wife Flora to the hospital. Two hours later, when he came to pick her up, she was nowhere to be found. He soon learned that she never even turned up for her appointment at the doctor's that day. Robert reported her missing to the police. Seasonal workers often disappeared because they went back home suddenly. But despite that fact, Flora's case was taken seriously. In 1985, Robert passed away. He never did find out what happened to his wife. Thirteen years later, the Concord shut its doors. In September of 2017, a skeleton of a woman was discovered in Orange County. It was thought that it might be Flora's. The case was assigned to Detective Rich Morgan. He found out that Flora had no living relatives. This meant that they couldn't determine whether Flora's DNA matched the DNA they found. The detective did however notice that there was someone using Flora Stevens' social security card number. A woman by the name of Flora Harris who lived in an assisted living facility in Massachusetts. He also noticed that this woman had the same birth date as Flora Stevens. On October 24th, he made his way to the assisted living facility. He showed her a photo of Flora Stevens before she disappeared. The woman simply said, me. When showed a photo of Robert, she said his name. He then lastly showed her a photo of the Concord back in his glory days and she started to smile brightly. Flora Stevens was finally found after 42 years. Sadly, the 79-year-old has dementia and can't remember how or why she disappeared in the first place.
Steve Carter was adopted at the age of four from an orphanage in Honolulu. He was adopted by a great family and when he grew up he married and considered having children of his own. He started getting curious as to who his real parents are. One day he clicked on missingchildren.com. Steve found an age progression image of a missing person by the name of Mark's Panama Moriarty Barnes. He instantly recognized the photo as himself. Stephen volunteered for a DNA test and learned that he was in fact a missing child. His biological father, Mark Barnes, reported him missing more than three decades earlier. His mother, Charlotte Moriarty, took him for a walk and never returned. When he was four years old, Charlotte gave him up for adoption and so he became Steve Carter. I think it's pretty incredible how he found himself. When Robert McDonough was 73 years old, he disappeared in Maine. He suffered from dementia. The search for him started almost immediately. Sniffer dogs were sent to search the surrounding woods. They even went as far as using an infrared helicopter. The next morning, a news crew was setting up to start reporting on the disappearance of Robert. Then suddenly an old man walked into the view behind the reporter. The man introduced himself to them as Robert McDonnell. Luckily Robert was in good health when he was found and only had a few scrapes. It is thought that he simply wandered off from his home and walked into the woods. Robert doesn't remember where he went or why he wandered off to begin with. His family promised to keep a closer eye on him and even said they are looking into GPS devices to help track Robert's whereabouts. Melvin Uphoff and Jacqueline Raines Crackman was dating in 1965. The thing was both of them were married to other people. Also in 1965, the two of them disappeared from a Nebraska town about a month apart from each other. It turns out the two of them simply ran away together and did not want to be found. There is very little known about this case since Malvin and Jacqueline wants their privacy. The two of them are still together and living in another state. What I really find upsetting is that Malvin had a three-year-old daughter when he decided to start a new life with Jacqueline. The daughter grew up without a father and she believed he was no longer alive. When questioned, she stated, I don't know what's worse, finding out my dad was dead, but he abandoned his family and has been living a new life. Harold Wayne Lovell was a troubled 19 year old in 1977. He lived in Chicago with his parents and two siblings. In May 1977, he had an argument with his mother and decided to leave home. Harold told his family he was going to look for a construction job, which he did. He left behind his mother, his stepfather, brother Tim and sister Teresa. His family didn't hear back from him after he left and he never returned so they got worried about him. They got even more worried about Harold when they heard about John Wayne Gacy. Gacy ended the lives of 33 young boys and men in the 1970s. Gacy was arrested in 1978. Gacy also worked at construction sites during that time and in the same area. He buried lots of victims under his house. Eight of the bodies found under Gacy's Chicago home was not positively identified. In 2011, the police asked all families who believed they are related to one of the eight unknown victims to come forward and send in their DNA. Howard's two siblings 
Tim and Teresa sent in their DNA since they strongly believed Howard was one of the eight victims. The DNA did not help solve this case. Before the test could be complete, there was a shocking revelation made. Tim and Teresa's nephew found a mugshot on mugshots.com of a person with the name Howard Wayne Lovell. The photo was of a man from Florida who was arrested in 2006 for possessing marijuana. The family quickly tracked Howard down in Florida. Howard immediately came to visit his family. He told them that he did go to work on construction sites, and believe it or not, but he did work with John Wayne Gacy for a while. Howard used to work in Gacy's garden every now and then. Gacy always tried to get him to come inside the house, but Howard always said no, because something felt wrong. Howard was sad to learn that his family thought he was not alive anymore. He never contacted them because he was under the impression they didn't care about him and wouldn't miss him at all. Howard had a few run-ins with the police, one of them resulting in the mugshot that led to him being found. While he was gone, he married and moved to Wisconsin, but when he got divorced, he decided to move to Florida. Howard's brother had this to say, I always had that inkling of hope he was alive. I would say, God, let me see my brother one more time. In 2010, Gregory Jean Jr. and his younger brother Samuel went to visit their father and his new wife Samantha Davis in Georgia. Samuel returned to their mother, Liza Smith, in Florida, but Gregory was forced to stay with his father, Gregory Sr. and Davis. When Gregory Jr. did not return to Liza, she called child services who did not know where to look. She was too afraid to call police since she was an immigrant from Haiti and feared deportation. In 2014, Liza got a Facebook friend request from her son and she quickly came into contact with him. He told her where he was. She finally decided to call police. The police then went to the house. Gregory Sr. and Davis said they didn't know where Gregory was and the police could not find him in the house. Liza then sent them pictures that Gregory had sent to her of his location in the house. The next day the police went again and this time they found a fake wall in the house. All this time Gregory Sr. and Davis kept Gregory Jr. behind a fake wall in their house. Liza and her daughter Tracy drove through the night to Georgia to retrieve her son and was finally reunited with Gregory Jr. Only then did she learn how horrible he was treated. Gregory Sr. and Davis originally kept him because that way they did not have to pay child support. Gregory said he was beaten with a stick, humiliated, forced to work as a maid, banned from celebrating Christmas and isolated from the outside world. Initially he was allowed to go to school, but when he told someone how badly he was treated, they started homeschooling him. Gregory hatched the plan though to contact his mother. He found a cell phone and connected it to a Wi-Fi network. He then downloaded an app that allows you to call via Wi-Fi. That was how he was able to call his mother and then continue messaging her on Facebook. Gregory Sr. and Davis have been charged of child cruelty and false imprisonment. Gregory Jr. asked for mercy for his father and stepmother. I just want to be free to live my life and let them live theirs, is what he had to say. One day, he wants to be a lawyer so he can hopefully help others. Judith Bellow was a 28-year-old wife and mother of two living in Stanwood, Washington. She worked at the National Food Corporation in Savannah. One day, in 1993, she was supposed to pick up her son from daycare, but never did. 
the police found her car abandoned at the Stanwood Post Office. There was nothing in the car that would indicate where she went, but they feared that she was made to foul play. Judith was close to her siblings and they didn't believe that she would just leave everyone behind. The police had no leads and the case went cold. That would be until 2011. In 2011, the Snohomish County Sheriff's Department received a call from a woman claiming to be Judith Bello. She told them that she just saw herself on a deck of cards about missing persons cases. She wanted to make sure that they did not need to look for her and her case was now solved. The police had to make sure that it was the real Judith Bello. They learned that she was now living in California. After some investigating, they were able to confirm that she was indeed the missing woman. Judith then called some of her family members to tell them she was alive and did not need to worry about her. She gave them a reason she disappeared. Judith wanted to get away from her abusive husband. She now had a new husband and they had three children of their own. Her family was just glad she is safe and was happy to hear news that she also had three sons. Judith claims she was scared to contact her family because of her first husband and what he might do to her siblings. Judith spent Thanksgiving and Christmas with her family and is now making up for lost time. Kathy Glass lived in Cobb County, Georgia in 1991. She was 31 years old and worked at a Cracker Barrel and lived at a Country Pines Apartments. Neighbors of Kathy called the police one evening when they heard loud noises coming from her apartment. The police found her body in the hallway. Her apartment was ransacked, so robbery was most likely the motive. The only evidence they had was a palm print, but it did not match anyone in the law enforcement database. With no other leads, the case went cold. In 2019, John Dawes, who is the lead investigator in Cobb County, was sorting through the evidence of Kathy's case when he spotted the palm print. He knew the automated fingerprint identification system recently expanded its records to include palm prints. Dawes knew it was worth a shot. The palm print matched 55-year-old Trent Allen Brown. He was already in jail in Indiana for burglary. He has a long rap sheet that includes forgery, theft, counterfeiting and receiving stolen property. Trent has been charged with malice murder and aggravated assault with intent to murder and burglary. Denise Sharon Kolb was a 27-year-old woman living in Pennsylvania with a boyfriend, Theodore Dull Donahue, who worked as a pizza delivery guy. On October 18, 1991, according to Donahue, a pair of them used crack cocaine and were robbed at gunpoint. Donahue says that Denise went to get help and that was the last time he saw her. The next day Denise attended a funeral with her family. That would be the last day they ever saw her alive. Three weeks after the funeral, a passerby found Denise's body in Birmingham Township, Delaware County. Her cause of death was most likely asphyxiation. It was difficult to say due to the decomposition. A long yellow sock was found on her lower back. The police also found a long yellow sock in Donahue's apartment. But they lost the yellow sock found at the crime scene and couldn't verify if the two socks was a pair. Donahue was a major suspect in the case, but no more evidence came forward and the case went cold. That was until 2015. Byron Wolf, the head of the photography program at the Temple University's Tyler School of Art and Architecture, 
use techniques to bring out details in the original crime scene photos. That was used to match the yellow sock that was found in Denise to the yellow sock found in Donahue's apartment. More and more information came to light that incriminated Donahue. He actually saw Denise after the funeral when he argued with her. The police found out that Donahue stayed at a motel a couple of times a year that was less than a mile away from where Denise was found. Donahue also admitted to the police that his nickname was Ted Bundy. Lisa Campbell, who worked with Donahue at a restaurant in the 1990s, testified that he told her that he once had a roommate who died on the couch and he was questioned by police about the death. She found it odd because he acted like he got away with something. Amber Booth, who had been a roommate of Donahue's in 2012 when they worked at Golden Crust Pizza, testified that Donahue told her one day he had just returned from visiting a spot in the woods where a former girlfriend's body had been found. He said that a woman's name was Denise and she was found face down, naked, with her legs spread. That is information only the killer and the police would know at that point. Donahue was finally arrested on 3rd September 2019 and charged with murder, abuse of a corpse, tampering of evidence, obstruction of justice and false reports to the police. In 1992, a body was found in a remote area of Arizona. The body was later identified to belong to a single mother, Denise Johnson. There was only one lead that police was able to find from the crime scene. They found a beeper, also known as a pager. The owner of the pager was truck driver Mark Bogan. When interviewed by police, Bogan claimed that he picked up Denise Johnson hitchhiking. At one point, Bogan claims Denise tried to steal his wallet and pager, but did not get away with the wallet as well. Bogan's story sounded like bogus, but the police couldn't disprove it. Also near the crime scene, there was a scrape on a branch of a tree. The detective took a photo of the scrape and also some of the beans of the tree. They also found the same type of beans in Bogan's truck. It didn't mean too much to them since that type of tree is all over Arizona. They had no way of proving that Bogan's truck brushed against that exact tree. Not yet at least. Dr. Timothy Helen Jarris from the University of Arizona created a whole genetic database of the trees in the area which have never been done before. He proved using that information that the DNA of the beans in Bogan's truck was a perfect match for the DNA of the scrap tree. Bogan will spend the rest of his life in jail. Roy McCaleb was a 51 year old man living in Texas and working as a foreman at a construction company in Texas. He was also a Korean War veteran. He lived with his wife Carolyn, his son and his son's wife. In 1985, all four of them were in the house when Roy was shot to death. Carolyn told the police that it was a man who assaulted her 10 days earlier that shot and killed her husband. She claimed that a man took her gun she had under her pillow and used it to shoot Roy. Roy's son, however, stated that he heard no one breaking into the house. Police also found no evidence of forced entry. Another strange thing was that she had been married to six men. Her last marriage actually overlapped with her marriage to Roy. Carolyn also took out life insurances on Roy that totaled 198,000 US dollars, which would give her a motive. In 2013, Carolyn pled guilty to murdering her husband Roy in exchange for only six months in prison. 
while in prison. She still maintained her innocence, however. Pamela Malom was 19 years old and studying at Indiana State University. On September 15, 1972, she attended a party. She left and told some of her friends that she would be right back. But she wasn't. Pamela never returned to her friends. The next day, two of her friends found her car parked about a block away from where she had parked it the day before. An hour later, Pamela's sister Sheila and her father went to Pamela's car with a spare set of keys. Her father screamed when he opened their car trunk and found his daughter's lifeless body inside. A thin white rope was wrapped around her neck and she also had her hands tied behind her back. DNA was recovered from a stain left on her light blue blouse. Seven weeks after her murder, Robert Wayne Austin was arrested for a murder. He was sentenced to life in prison, but not for killing Pamela. Police found no evidence linking him to Pamela. In 2018, the DNA on the blouse was sent into Parabon Nano Labs. A result came back with a family where the DNA came from. Finally, Jeffrey Linhand was identified as the killer. Jeffrey passed away in 1978, however, from a shootout with the police. Gabriel Nagy lived in Sydney, Australia, with his wife Pamela, his son Stephen, and his daughter Jennifer. Gabriel emigrated to Australia with his parents when he was just a young boy and loved life in Australia with his family. He was a devoted father and had a family that respected him and couldn't imagine anything ever getting between them. But unfortunately, something did. Gabriel worked as a shop fitter. He helped companies build retail spaces around the city. He wanted to be an accountant, however, and was taking classes to achieve his dream. In 1987, Gabriel went into the city to run some errands. He called his wife Pamela to tell her that he would be home for lunch. Pamela made lunch and waited for her husband, but he never came home. She waited until she received a call that changed her life forever. The police had found a burned out shell of Gabriel's car on the side of the road. There was no son of Gabriel Nagy to be found. Pamela and her two children started putting out missing persons flyers all over Sydney. Surely someone had to know what happened to Gabriel after the car accident. Unfortunately, no one knew. Two weeks after Gabriel disappeared, the police determined that he withdrew money from a bank in the city of Newcastle. Newcastle is about 100 miles away from Sydney. His family was hopeful about this new lead and believed this would help them find Gabriel. The lead turned into a dead end, however and the case went cold for two more decades. There was a senior constable by the name of Georgia Robinson. She promised herself that she would solve this case. In her last attempt at finding Gabriel, she did just that. She looked through some files when she came across something. The Medicare system in Australia showed documents that a person named Gabriel Nagy recently underwent eye surgery. The records also showed that a man went by another name, Ron Saunders. Constable Robinson called this man. The man told her that the last two decades of his life was fuzzy, to say the least. He spent most of the time homeless, just wandering from city to city. That was until a pastor by the name of Barry Heho came across Gabriel. The pastor gave Gabriel a job at a church as a caretaker. Gabriel got a name Ron Saunders from a sign for Queensland's Saunders Beach while he wandered around. His memory slowly came back, so when he got the eye surgery, he gave the name of Gabriel Nagy as well. Robinson flew to where Gabriel was currently living and showed him pictures of his family. 
more and more of his memories started to come back. A car accident Gabriel was in left him with a serious head injury. He then fell into a fugue state which led him to forget everything about his life. Gabriel described the situation as unreal. He still didn't fully remember his family. He vowed to keep in touch but he couldn't bring himself to move back in with his family. Denise Bolzer was a 24-year-old woman living in Manchester, New Hampshire. She worked as a bookkeeper for a small company. On January 17, 1985, she disappeared and the only lead was a note that was left behind. A few days after her disappearance, police found her pickup truck at Logan Airport in Boston. Her social security card, birth certificate, local charge cards were neatly organized in a car stall. A year after she disappeared, she was indicted in absentia for embezzling $12,000 from the company she worked for. That was all the police had to go on, and the case went cold. That was until 17 years later, in 2002. In 2002, the FBI believed they found her. She was now going by the name of Denise Jones. She was still a bookkeeper and had started a new family. But now 42-year-old Denise was elated to see her family when they knocked on her door. She explained that her boss threatened her life because of the embezzlement. She claims that it was close to $100,000 she embezzled. The county prosecutors dropped the charges against her because her former boss was long deceased. Denise lived in South Carolina, the Bahamas, California and Hawaii while she was missing and lived in Florida since 1996. Her current husband was stunned but said a lot of things that didn't make sense before did now. His wife would always be depressed on Mother's Day and out of sorts on holidays. She never talked about family. Nguyen T. Vaughn was a 16-year-old student living in Hanoi, Vietnam in 1992. Vaughn was very beautiful and got the attention of a lot of boys. This led her to not focus on her studies at all and she spent most of her time going out with her friends. One such evening she arrived home after curfew and her mother refused to open the door for her. That night Vaughn disappeared. Her mother, Vu Ti Ha, regretted what she did greatly. She was quoted as saying, At that time I thought my daughter was corrupted. Today it is not so serious. After being refused into her home, Vaughn went to a karaoke bar with her friends, where she met a woman called Tan. This woman led Vaughn and her friends to a bar near the Chinese-Vietnam border. They spent the night drinking and singing. The next morning Vaughn woke up and was shocked to learn that she and her friends were held captive in a house in China. The woman forced Vaughn and her three friends to marry Chinese men of around 70 and 80 years old. When Vaughn refused, she was punished. Eventually Vaughn was introduced to five men for her to marry. One of them was 40 years old. She chose a man that was 40 as she was scared what they were going to do to her if she refused them all. A year later she had a child with her husband and learned that the house they lived in was situated in a Guangdou province. Vaughn tried to run away twice and both times she failed. After the failure of her third attempt she was chained for two weeks. Vaughn met a Vietnamese driver who worked at a farm near her house. She begged him to help her after she told him her whole story. The driver came up with the idea of putting her in a cage of pigs in the back of his truck to make sure she was not seen. They drove for 70 kilometers before taking a cab. They kept moving to the Vietnam-China border for another 100 kilometers. After saying goodbye to the cab driver, the truck driver and Vaughn traveled for three more months on their way to the border. Once they got there, they met a taxi driver who took them over the border for free 
since I had no money. Once entering Vietnam, Vaughn was scared that her family has passed away. This was now 21 years after she disappeared. The truck driver told Vaughn, however, if your parents died and your family does not accept you, you can come back to live with me. With that reassurance, Van went to look for her family. She asked many people for help, since her noise changed so much since she had left. The sixth person she asked was her uncle. They did not recognize each other until Vaughn told him that she was Mrs. Ha's daughter. Her uncle dropped a bundle of vegetables he was carrying and ran to his sister's house. At first she did not believe him until she saw a long lost daughter with her own eyes. Petra Patsika was a 24 year old computer science student at a Braunschweig University in Germany. On July 26 of 1984, she visited her dentist and then went to a shop to buy a printer cartridge that she planned to give to her younger brother Karsten for his birthday. Petra also tells her neighbor Misha to water her plants while she's away. She planned on visiting her parents in Wolfsburg for the holidays. Petra informs her parents how she's looking forward to be there for the holidays, finishing her schoolwork and when looking after her younger brother. Her family was excited for Petra to come home, but unfortunately she never did. At first they thought that she stayed longer at the university, but there were no signs of her there. Two days later when she missed Karsten's birthday party, her parents finally reported her missing. There was not too much to go on for the police, and the case went cold. In 1985, a 19-year-old carpenter's apprentice, simply known as Gunter K, confessed to ending the lives of both Petra and her 14-year-old. The police did not believe his story however, and found that he had nothing to do with Petra's disappearance. In September of 2015, 31 years after Petra disappeared, there was finally a breakthrough in the case. The police was called to an apartment in Düsseldorf belonging to a 35-year-old woman by the name of Petra Schneider. The police wanted to see her ID and only then she told him the truth that she is the girl that went missing 31 years ago. She said that she carefully planned her disappearance. Even after being found, she wants no contact with her family. Since her disappearance, she had been living in various places across Germany, under the name of Petra Schneider. She had no passport, identity card, bank account, doctor, dentist or insurance. If it wasn't for the burglary at her apartment, the case may never have been solved. She saved up 4,000 Deutsche Marks, equivalent to 1,500 pounds, to fund her disappearance and moved into an apartment in Gelsenkirchen. Petra avoided everyone and kept to herself mostly. Her family is devastated. The police is trying to arrange a reunion between Petra and her family, but she is adamant about never wanting to see them again. Thank you all for your attention and viewership. Please leave your feedback in the comment section of this video so that we can timeline respond and address any question you may have assisting you. If you find it interesting, please like and click the bell icon below to not miss the last video from our editorial team. Goodbye and see you again in the next new update from 24 Hours channel.